Good morning, everybody. Wow, uh, so many people again. That's awesome. Um, people, good morning. Um, we are going to start this webinar. Um, uh, I hope this webinar finds you well and that all your loved ones are having a safe time in these highly demanding and sometimes challenging times. Um, luckily, uh, at least here in Amsterdam, it's summer, um, sunny, so um, good seeing all of you. Um, today, we're going to talk about communication between humans and machines. Um, and um, uh, this is our webinar streak that we've had. Uh, we've had Tech of China, we had GPT-3. Today, we're going to talk about future communication. Um, and um, uh, later on, we'll be talking about new sustainability technologies. Um, but today, we're going to talk about future communication. This is Tim Berners-Lee. Um, and uh, uh, most consider him as the inventor of the World Wide Web. And when he went, invented this World Wide Web in 18, uh, 1989, he worked at the CERN, uh, the European Organization for Nuclear Research. Um, but he wasn't the one who actually exploited the internet. These were the first successful internet companies like Microsoft with Explorer, but obviously many more. Um, and this is uh, Torlaev Monseng. He uh, worked at the Norwegian Institute of Technology in 1987, and he is being called the inventor of the GSM network. Um, but it was not him, but it was Deutsche Bundespost, the German postal service company um, that invested big in the technology and is now known as T-Mobile. Um, this is Jeff Hahn, and he is a professor at New York University. And this is in 2006, where Ted was really young still. Um, and he's not the first to um, actually come up with a touchscreen, but he did make a awesome and really interactive multi-gesture touchscreen. Um, this was 2006. About 14 months later, um, the iPhone came out. Steve Jobs saw this, being a real inventor, saw this technology and thought, this is my solution to an iPhone. Um, this is Marion Franklin Rudy. He's the inv an inventor at NASA, um, and he made the invention of air cushioning for shoes. He saw this invention uh, at the NASA where they made some sort of foam with a gas in there, and shoe companies didn't see it. And then Nike picked it up in 1978, and obviously we now have the Nike Air. And last one, this is Wally Ripple. He's a professor at Caltech, um, and people call him the inventor of the current uh, uh, battery electric vehicle motor. Um, obviously, electric cars has been here for about 100 years, even more. And this guy made the T0, but the actual technology was picked up by Tesla, and it now it's being exploited within the whole um, car industry. So this is a big belief that I have. Um, innovation is an invention with a business case. Um, and what I find really awesome is that uh, uh, these inventors um, uh, has been and have been inventing, but usually you see that they have solutions and then they are looking for a problem still. And you want to do that the other way around. You want to have problems looking for a solution or maybe even better, you want to have opportunities that are looking for an enabler. And there's so many opportunities here because um, we live in a world where the population of the earth is increasing by 152 people every min minute. That's netto. Um, and it's the first time that there are more uh, people over 65 than then are children younger than five. 940 million people do not have access at, at, to el electricity today. Every day, about 8 million pieces of plastic find their way into the oceans. 39% of all habitable land on Earth is used for meat or meat production. Um, and on average, the social media user spends about two hours on their phone or on social media. And that in a time, and now we're getting back to communication, we're going to talk about later, Two thirds of the world's school age children have no in internet access today. The 20 warmest years on record have been recorded in the past 22 years. And the number of people living in the streets in Europe have doubled since 2010. And these are just some stats, some truths about the world that we live in. Um, and it's difficult. Um, maybe take a moment to breathe here. 
And I think the reason that we are here today at a distance is because we're in the middle of a drastic change. And I think the pandemic is just part of that change. Um, we must simply acknowledge that I think that the world of gradual, predictable change is just a thing of the past. And we are living in a world of epic change where exponent exponential technologies cause things to change at hair raising speeds. Um, everything is hyper-connected. And there are all these global challenges and opportunities that seem intertwined. And I think um, that's why I'm so interested in this conversation, this webinar today, here with all of you, because the reason that we want to present this topic is because I think that now, more than ever, every company should explore their future constantly. This is Wayne Gretzky. Um, People think, and I'm one of these believers, that he is the best ice hockey player to ever, ever play the game. And he has this awesome qu quote where he says, I skate to where the puck is going, not to where it has been. Um, and I find this absolutely true for business today. Skate toward, towards where the puck is going. Don't go after the puck. Don't go to where it has been, but skate after the puck. Or sk skate to where the puck is going. So a little bit about us, and then we get into Bram, my colleague. Um, we are a research and prototyping studio. We have a research team that is constantly looking, one, at our clients to where they want to be at in three, five, seven years from now, and what technologies enable that kind of future. And we have a prototyping team, and they can actually build these technologies and see whether these technologies have the value that we think is in there. Um, and that way, we try to make our clients first movers, but maybe more importantly, we aim to fast forward innovation since we think that our life and our business and our planet have a world to gain from widely implemented new technologies. How we do that? Typically, we start off with an aspiring goal that our clients have. Um, then second, we try to discover new technologies that enable that aspiring goal. Then we determine the value of that opportunity. We try to look at, does it have a business case already? Or how does that then work? But also, what kind of assumptions do we have on this technology that we don't have an answer to, but we need an answer to before we actually invest in it? And then we develop a prototype to give answers to these assumptions so that we actually can validate that something is a good investment. Um, so the purpose of today, um, we try to explore new ways of human-machine communication. We'll dive into new developments of privacy. Um, and we'll have some future insight. What will new communication methods enable? That's what we'll talk about today. Um, the payoff, well, there's been years of scientific research. Um, there's been uh, uh, lots of influences going on. And we try to boil it down in 60 minutes, about a 30, 25, 30-minute 30 talk. Um, we'll quickly receive the latest insight of this emerging technologies on uh, communication. And um, you'll understand how you could leverage these technologies and how it will enable opportunities within your business. Um, preview, this was my introduction. Um, now we get to the main part, that's Bram. And afterwards, we'll have a QA. and a um, Totally 65, 60 minutes, about 45 minutes of talks. At the end, 15 minute Q&A. The chat is moderated for questions. So at the end, we'll have your questions and answer them. There will be no breaks. And tomorrow, you will all be receiving an email um, with a recording that we've made of this so that you can share this. Um, a little bit on COVID. All the gear is disinfected. We've washed our hands. We are using mouth caps. We have some colleagues here that are using mouth caps. We'll try and keep in distance as much as we can, also during the Q&A. Um, and that's it. Um, we're going to talk about communication between humans and machines. Um, and the one who will tell you all about it is my colleague, Bram. I'm super excited to have you here on stage. Good luck, man. Yes. Thanks a lot. All right. Awesome. So hello, everyone. And thanks again for tuning in to the webinar. And let's talk about the future of communication between humans and machines. We're going to cover several topics like closed networks, open networks. We're going to talk a little bit about main tricks, 
we're going to give you a live demo, and then at the end, we're going to give you some applications and examples that you can uh, leave with today, so you have a little bit of an idea of how you can apply this into uh, your company. But before we do all this, I'd like to give two examples of what I think the future of communication is going to look like. And the first one is that the interaction between humans and AI will become far more common in the future. So right now, an AI is mostly used and accessible to people who have a background in programming. And this is great if you have a background in programming, but if you don't, it's not very helpful. We've given a webinar before on GPT-3, and it uh, tells you a lot about how well AIs already are at processing natural languages. So that means uh, that with an AI, you can already process a language of someone who doesn't know how to program. They can give an instruction or something, and the AI can just interpret it. So for example, think here of a supermarket where they're trying to check stock or they're trying to order something and then someone asks to order some new USB sticks and the AI can just interpret it and based on what a human is saying, it can take some uh, machine actions and then do some stuff with the AI. The second example that I would like to give is about how communication will become a personal choice. According to Facebook, every American citizen has eight communication apps installed on their phone on average. And most Americans have some apps on their phone installed that they don't actually want to use, but they have installed because other people want them to use that app. And we believe that in the future, this will become less and less of a problem and it will, be, it will become more of a personal choice. Which app do you want to use? And you, you will use that app and not the apps that you don't want to use. So with these examples in mind, I'd like to ask a question, which is who's the owner of email? So if you Google who's the owner of WhatsApp, you'll get a clear answer. If you Google who's the owner of Slack, who's the owner of Telegram, uh, who's the owner of Discord, you name it, you always get a clear answer by Google. They immediately, before they give any search results, oh, they say, this is the owner. But with email, Google doesn't really know. And that's also, it, it makes sense because there isn't really an owner of email. So back in the day when the internet was starting in the United States, there were several internet providers like ARPANET, UUCP, BitNet, et cetera, et cetera. And they all had their own network. And at some point they decided that it would be great uh, that you would be able to communicate with anyone on the internet. No matter or of which provider you used or where you lived, you would be able to talk to everyone. And this is how SMTP came to be, which is the protocol that email still uses nowadays. They had this goal in mind that the internet was supposed to be open and accessible. And no matter who you were or where you lived, you would be able to talk to anyone, which is a great idea. I mean, the last thing you would want is that there's one person or one company or one service on the internet who controls all the data and that everyone has to trust that one service to make sure that communication is actually happening. But even though that sounds almost like a horror story, it's actually true nowadays. We all rely on closed networks. And before I talk about open networks, I want to mention closed networks first. Examples of closed networks are networks like WhatsApp, Slack, Signal, Telegram, Discord, Rocket Chat, etc., etc. These are networks where you do not directly communicate with your relatives, but you all re uh, communicate to the server. So for example, let's say I want to send a picture of my cat to a friend, then I send the picture of the cat to the WhatsApp server, and then WhatsApp forwards it to uh, my friend, which raises the privacy question. What is WhatsApp exactly doing with my picture of my cat? Are they just sending it to my friend? Are they storing it on a server? Are they encrypting it? Are they sending it to other people? I don't know. And the problem with closed networks is that most of them aren't very transparent. So instead they say, oh, don't worry, you can trust us. And that's, that. I mean, this is fine if we're talking about if you're discussing with your friend what your favorite color is, but if we're talking about some serious classified information, you really cannot use a closed network that just is based on trust. That's just not enough. 
Take a look at the Albert Heijn, for example, two months ago, who couldn't sell any cheese for two entire weeks because their cheese distributor had been hacked with ransomware. What happened? The cheese distributor made use of Microsoft Exchange, which is basically a Microsoft way of communicating, and you can exchange data and databases and files, etc. And they had their entire database of which cheese is stored where in their warehouse uh, on Microsoft Exchange. And Microsoft Exchange had a vulnerability, uh, and Microsoft knew about it, but they never fixed it. And some hackers found out about the vulnerability, and they abused it. So they took all the data from the cheese distributor, and the cheese distributor couldn't deliver any cheese. So the problem with this is that a closed network can sometimes screw you over. And even if Microsoft doesn't have any um, bad intentions with your data, then security breaches and leaks like these can still happen. So if we're talking about some financial risks, you really cannot take the, oh, just trust us guarantee to just rely on that with all your data. So the alternative to a closed network like uh, Microsoft or WhatsApp, for example, is an open network. Think of an open network the way email works. There's not really one person who owns an open network, but it's that a lot of people can connect to an open network and all talk to each other. So instead of an, a closed network being centralized where everyone talks to this one big server and that one big server says, you can absolutely trust me, I'll do it the right way. A, an open network uh, is decentralized, which basically means that you choose with whom you want to communicate. You choose with whom you share your data. And this is also called data sovereignty. You choose who gets and doesn't get to see your data. And an open network has several benefits. So first off, it is open for everyone, which means that if you are connected to an open network, there's always lots of competition. There's never one big player, but everyone, there are several parties who are constantly fighting to be the best one, to deliver the best service at the lowest price. Uh, you also retain full control over your infrastructure you get to decide which data is stored where. And instead of Microsoft knowing about vulnerabilities but not telling you, you choose services that are tra transparent about it. So, I mean, no one is immune to, be to risks of being hacked, but on an open network, you are completely aware of the risks. So if you know I may be using a service that could get hacked, well, then I better take make a backup somewhere else so that if my cheese distributor gets hacked, then at least I have a backup to rely on. The third one is that it's future proof. So let's say you're using some service on an open network and you ever later decide, you know what, I want to change my mind. Well, then you just can switch over to a better service or one that's cheaper because an open network always allows communication with any other service that just may come around the corner the next day. And the last one is that an open network doesn't suffer from the network effect. And the network effect is something that's both a psychological but also an information theoretical effect, which basically means that the network is only as useful as its amount of users. For example, uh, if you install WhatsApp on your phone, you'll probably gain a lot of use out of it because a lot of people use WhatsApp, so it's probably that you, it's very probable that you can talk to a lot of people on WhatsApp. However, for example, in the Netherlands, the app Rocket Chat is used by nearly no one. So if you install the app Rocket Chat on your phone, you probably won't get a lot of use out of it because no one uses the app, so you can't really talk to anyone. On an open network, it doesn't matter which app you choose because they can just all talk to each other. And the benefit of that also is that you don't need everyone um, convinced to move over to the same uh, platform as you want to use because you can just make a personal choice. I would like to use this platform. The other people may perhaps choose a different platform, but that's fine because we can still talk to each other. So I thought, well, let's uh, compare close and open network to each other and let's see what the differences are. What are the benefits? So I've taken two uh, services that are very similar to each other with the main difference being that one is on a closed network and one is on an open network. The one on the closed network is Slack. 
Slack is uh, very popular in, among companies, so I thought that would be a great example. So Slack has a guaranteed uptime of 99%, so they're pretty much always available. They deliver 20 gigabytes of storage. You have unlimited integrations, so you can integrate a lot of services into Slack. And if anything ever goes wrong, you always get support within the first four hours of making the notification. So let's say I have a company of 200 employees and I want to get a service of Slack. Slack charges uh, 11 euros and 75 cents per member per month. So that means that I pay a price of about 28K per year. I have a question though, who are Slack's competitors? I mean, if you ever decide to switch over, who are you really going to switch over to? Are you going to switch to Microsoft Teams or to Discord if you don't like Slack? I mean, if you think about it, Slack doesn't encrypt your messages when they store your messages on their database. Slack also has their databases in the United States and the United States has legislation that allows the US government to view any data on any American server, which means that Slack cannot guarantee that the US government will not spy on your data. They also do not support or deliver any end-to-end -end encryption. And I mean, you can download or export the data that Slack has about you, but Slack doesn't give any direct access to the actual database that stores your data. But perhaps that's fine and you think, well, okay, let's live with that. But what if Slack ever decides, you know what? Let's charge you one euro extra per member per month. For my company of 200 people that will raise the price without a clear reason from about 28K to a little more than 30K. That's a lot of money actually, especially if it's for no reason. I mean, two and a half thousand euros per year is a lot of money, but is it really enough for me to consider moving over to something else? Once you really invest it to a close network like Slack, you'll discover that it becomes really difficult to move over to a different platform. So that has a lot of risks, um, and you'll see uh, later on why that's going to be a big problem if you invest in a close network. So let's compare it to EMS. EMS is very similar to Slack in the sense that you can let your company on EMS and they have their own workspace and then you can communicate with everyone within your company. But the only difference is that their network is open, so they also allow communication with the outside world. So first off, they deliver end-to-end -end encryption, which Slack doesn't. They also let you choose in which country you want to host all your data. You have a lot of migration tools, which basically means that if you ever decide to change your mind, they have a lot of tools for you available to leave their service. They even have device verification, which basically means that if a hacker ever tries to log in on your account, they cannot do anything until you verify that the device is safe. But instead, they only charge four euros per member per month. So for my company, that will be done less than 10,000 euros per year. Which is quite wondrous if you think about it, because Slack is way more expensive, although it uh, delivers none of these services. So why is EMS that much cheaper? Well, there are several reasons for it. And the first one is pretty obvious. It's less advanced, less polished, because Slack already exists for over nine years. They also have a lot of users, they have a lot of supporters, and they have a lot of money. So effectively, they've already had a lot of time and a lot of money to invest into a lot of features. So they're already much further ahead, whereas EMS only exists for a little bit more than a year, maybe two years. So they haven't had the time to invest that well into an as polished service. So you get a little bit of a better experience when you use Slack. But the last reason, and this one is very important, is that EMS has direct first level competitors. It is very difficult to move out from Slack, but if you ever decide to move out from EMS, there are several competitors who are already uh, yeah, willing to help you out and to move over. So with Slack, for example, 
um, if you want to move over, you have to convince every single employee to export all their data and to move it over to a new platform. And you have to figure it all out, configure it, and then convince everyone because there will always be a few people who had some nice setups in Slack and really don't want to get rid of that, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas if you decide to move from EMS to a different service, then it's just on a Sunday night, a programmer will give an announcement like heads up, we're going to switch service. So communication may be a bit rocky tonight. So if a message doesn't send, you probably need to send it the second time or third time, but that's it. The other people don't need to do anything. It's already all taken care of because the uh, communication is just rerouted from the one service to the other on the open network. And because they just have so many competition, they cannot just out of nowhere raise the price. If they do, well, then you'll just switch over. Whereas with Slack, it's a typical thing that they start as a startup. They have a low price and you think, oh, wow, this is great. A lot of service, low price. But once you really invest it and you cannot really leave anymore, that's when they start raising the price and where you're paying up the real big money. So it seems pretty obvious to go forward with the openness and to uh, think, wow, let's just move to an open network. And not only is this also does does this have great business uh, uh, profits, but there's also other reasons to move to open networks. And that's just people care more about being able to communicate openly with everyone than subscribing to one specific service and not being able to talk to the other people. Because you see it everywhere. Email is open. SMS is an open network. Telecommunication is open. Pretty much every communication device has an open network. You can even fax on an open network. Telecommunication is a great example as well. Imagine if you needed a subscription on T-Mobile to call with your work and your company, but you need a subscription to Vodafone because your family uses Vodafone and you need 10 different telecommunication subscriptions because you want to talk to different people. We'd think that'd be nuts. And well, the same thing is happening in every medium over and over again. It starts a bit close, but sooner or later, it becomes an open network. So open networks really aren't a question of if it will happen, it's a question of when it will happen. So that may raise the question, the internet already exists for a long time, so why isn't it already a thing? Why isn't everything, if it's so great, open networks, why isn't every single company already on an open network right now? Well, there's three reasons for that. The first one is that people just really love email, which, on the one hand, it makes no sense at all because it's a 40-year-old protocol. It is very old-fashioned. Uh, the, the security is horrible. Um, there's barely any encryption going on. But the great thing about email is that it has the benefits of an open network. And that's why it sticks around for so long. People just really enjoy email because you can email anyone. It doesn't matter how much or how little you care about privacy or about your data sovereignty, anyone can use email in their own accords. Additionally, pretty much no one knows any other open networks on the internet. I mean, I'm pretty sure that most people watching right now have never heard of AIM, have never heard of XMPP, have never heard of ICQ. These are all open networks, but no one knows about them. Another big reason on why it's not already implemented is that centralized networks are simply more commercially attractive. Back in 2008, both Google and Facebook were already connected to XMPP, which is one of those open networks. But they both discovered independently that, well, if you just don't allow communication with the outside world, you make it more difficult for your users to leave your, uh, to leave your network and they even make it uh, much better because it almost becomes like a pyramid scheme where you have to convince your uh, friends to join the same network if you want to talk to them. So from a company standpoint, it can be really attractive if you do not allow communication with the outside world. Um, but so, and the third reason is that um, if people really don't care about open networks, uh, it can become really difficult, but if we're talking about already existing open networks who should be really attractive, then there's something that we've discovered in the communication of the internet. The communication on the internet is massive. It's literally humongous. And what we've discovered is that 
most open networks currently communicate in a one-on-one -on -one style. So basically it's with email, with SMS, with calling. It's also uh, always a message from one person to one person. SMS is always one-on-one. -on -one. It's never a, a group or something. But we already know that humans are social creatures and we fare much better in group chats with like a company or a group of friends where one person types something, everyone can read it and you don't have to respond or to do something like a reply all or something. It's just some people just stick around, read for a bit. Some people ignore the conversation. Some people who happen to be online reply on it. And this way, a conversation is way more dynamic and way more focused around groups of social humans. And so far, open networks haven't really focused on those, those group chats and only on one-on-one -on -one conversations, which simply do not work that well. Until two years ago, when the open network matrix uh, came up, and as soon as it had its first stable software released, like about two years ago, to a 2018, I believe, um, things started changing rapidly, and I'm talking about really quickly. So Matrix, uh, even though it's a very young and new open network, it, it already has over 22 million addressable users. It has 50,000 servers connected to the Matrix, as far as we know, because the whole point of data sovereignty is that you get to decide whether people know about your server. So Matrix estimates that they already have over 100,000 servers, but 50,000 servers are currently public and available, and they already have hundreds and hundreds of projects, among which a few pretty big ones. For example, the entire French government only relies on Matrix now because they really care about the safety and security that the real-time communication of Slack delivers. Every child in the state of Hamburg and who is in a public school is going to communicate using Matrix, which is almost a, a half a million uh, uh, children because they want to make sure that the communication is safe and not all the data of all those children is getting sold to some foreign country or company or whatever. And there's also some very big projects that already endorse Matrix and recommend its use for its privacy and security. I wanted to look at three examples and how and why they use it. The first one is the German Armed Forces, which is basically all the departments of the German Army, the Bundeswehr. And they, you almost couldn't believe it, because at this point, if you care about privacy, you really cannot use WhatsApp anymore. But two years ago, the German Army seriously still used WhatsApp to communicate. And well, Germany just thought that wouldn't be a wise thing to store all their data somewhere in the United States or who knows where. So instead, they're now using Matrix completely because of its end-to-end -end encryption, because of its security, and because they know 100% sure where the data is stored, what's happening with it. So instead of having some data unencrypted, you, who knows where, they're having it encrypted in Germany where they can trust their own services. A big other player is the Wikimedia Foundation, which is also responsible for the website Wikipedia. And their goal and their uh, belief is that information should be free and accessible for everyone. So what they wanted is that they wanted their communication to be completely independent of any profit-based company. So they've joined Matrix where they have their own servers where they can spread information on their own accords. They are completely in charge of the information that they have and their own data so that they do not rely on one company that may perhaps sometimes decide to just raise the price out of nowhere. And the last great example is Mozilla Thunderbird, which is mostly known for being an old email client. The Thunderbird is also uh, meant as an alternative to allow for communication in an open, transparent way where you can trust that the one who gives uh, the service to you, uh, which would in, that, in this case be Mozilla, um, doesn't secretly screw you over or sell any data to anyone. Instead, they wanted to, to have a communication that's as transparent transparent and as safe as possible. So they use Matrix because you know what is happening on Matrix. On an open network, you have that guarantee. So these are some pretty good details, I would personally say. 
But something that Matrix advertised itself very strongly on is its interoperability. And what that basically means is that traditionally, uh, a closed network can only talk to people on a closed network. On WhatsApp, you cannot talk to anyone outside of WhatsApp. That'd be ridiculous, right? Well, so what B Matrix basically has done is that they've allowed for connections between their own open network, Matrix, and closed networks. For example, if we're talking about Discord, if we're talking about something like uh, WhatsApp or something like Telegram, you can connect those closed networks to the Matrix. And hence, as a Matrix user, I personally use Matrix myself, I can talk to people who use Discord. I can talk to people who use Telegram or WhatsApp. I can just talk to them. Or even better, I can not only talk to humans, but it's even possible to have a communication with a robot. For example, a demo that uh, Matrix gave about three to four years ago is that they made a bridge between the Matrix and uh, the software that a drone was using. So they were able to open a chat, like a normal group chat, with a drone, and then from the chat, they were able to control that drone. So they were able to type commands like go up, go forward, look to the left, uh, go right, all those kind of commands, and they could just control the drone from a chat. Or even cooler, even cooler, they were able to open a video chat with the drone, and then they were able, as if it's like a Zoom call, they were able to view the from the drone's perspective what he was seeing from the camera from the eye that the drone had so they were able to from anywhere in the world able to control and see the drone from their matrix clients and since we can connect all those we can even connect for example a whatsapp user to that drone so it would even be theoretically possible to have from no matter which platform you use a video chat with a drone how cool is that I think it's pretty cool. So basically, uh, how they call these connections between Matrix and another uh, closed network is that Matrix calls them bridges because you're basically bri making a bridge between two networks. This way, even though some networks may be closed, it's still possible to allow for communication between several networks. And they've built a lot of bridges already. So if you see, recognize any logos of these, then it's already possible to communicate with people on that platform if you use Matrix. So this is not something from the future. This is already possible right now. Um, so we're talking about Slack, Discord, WhatsApp, SMS, email, Twitter, Instagram, you name it, and it's already possible. And I'd like to give a live demo of that. Uh, I'd like to prove this point to s show you that it's not just like some crazy idea, but it's already happening right now. Um, so what I've set up is I've made a matrix room and that matrix room has a bridge to both a Telegram group chat and a Discord server, which basically means is that if there's anyone in the Discord server, in the matrix server or in the Telegram chat, typing, sending anything, then everyone in all those other chats and in the same chat, of course, can all read those messages. So everyone in those three chats can all communicate with each other. So if you could share the screen, I would like to give a quick demo of that. And um, I'm going to show it first. And after that, I'll be, uh, th these three rooms are currently public. So it's even possible to join these rooms yourself and to try it out yourself. Um, so right now here, I'm currently on the left and I'm already typing hello from Discord. You can already see in the middle, which is matrix, it already says that I'm typing something and on the right there's Telegram. Oh. So if I type on the left, hello from Discord and I send the message, you will see that we get a new message in both matrix at the bottom and on Telegram. Well, it's the same case that if I right now type something in Matrix, so if I type hello from Matrix, then you'll see that the message not only appears in Matrix, but that it also appears in Discord and in Telegram. We can even make this, well, I, I'm sure you can already guess what happens if I send this message in Telegram. If I type hello from Telegram and I send it, and the message appears in both uh, in Telegram, Matrix, and Discord. 
I believe the link will be sent now in the chat. So if that link's being sent, then you can try it out for yourself. Yes? Okay. So um, I'll keep these rooms open for, uh, well, for a while. Uh, the bridges will be available for at least a few weeks, so you don't need to try it right now. But if you think, how, wow, this is cool, I want to try it now, feel free to. Um, I'm going to see if it's okay, uh, if you can get back. Yes, excellent. Okay. So basically, I'll uh, leave these rooms open for at least a few weeks so you can just check it out and you can ask some questions or have a conversation with someone on a different chat. Um, we'll also send the links to those chats in the email that you'll receive later today, so don't worry about it. Okay, um, awesome. So we're going to continue now with the last part of the webinar which is then I wanted to give you a few examples of some applications of how you can uh, implement matrix into your company. And I've thought of three examples of different sizes of companies and how they can implement the matrix into their company already. So the first one is the warehouse. And the idea of the warehouse is that, uh, let's say Alice has a, uh, owns a large warehouse and she has this idea that she wants to, uh, she currently has a lot of human employees, that she wants to integrate machines more and more into her warehouse. And she hopes that this can be a smooth transition. Um, see, yeah, there we go. And she wants to make a smooth transition from human employees to machines. She has a lot of machines that she wants to buy and implement into her warehouse over the course of the next few years, let's say 10 years from now. That uh, if we're 10 years later, and does the slide go through? Yeah, there we go. Uh, 10 years from now, she wants to have a huge amount of uh, robots and machines in her warehouse. This is already possible if you connect those machines to Matrix, because that way you can even have a communication. And even if Alice doesn't have a background in programming, well, then she can just use an AI like GPT-3 to translate her uh, normal messages to code and instructions that machines can understand. So that if it ever perhaps uh, turns out that uh, something goes wrong in the warehouse, perhaps if a cabinet falls over, and she can start a video call with a drone inside her warehouse so that she can take a look at the problem. So she can assess the situation, perhaps from home or for, from an office, so that she can, in the gr same group chat where the drone is connected to, talk to humans or perhaps to machines to fix the problem that may be going on in the uh, warehouse. So that perhaps some human says, oh, uh, I'll fix it. A cabinet's fallen over. I'll just put it right back up. Or perhaps there's a large machine that says, oh, I'll fix it and put it back up. And this way, uh, Alice can communicate to both her employees and to her machines in the warehouse through the use of Matrix. Another big uh, example is the laundromat. So let's say that Bob owned a laundromat and he wants to innovate and move forward to the future and he also wants to give his customers the seven star experience. So what he has done is he has made his laundromat ready for the future. So what he has done is he has hooked up his laundry machines to the internet in a way that they can give a message whenever, um, whenever the laundry machine is done washing laundry. So originally he had created an app that could give a notification, but the problem is that most people don't really care about an app. They don't really want to install an entire app just to get one notification whenever the laundry machine is done. So instead, what Bob could do here uh, in the next 10 years is that he could uh, hook his own account and his laundry machines up to Matrix so that both he and his laundry machines can communicate on Matrix. And then other people can join the matrix so that they can get a text message, almost like a chat message from the laundry machine whenever the mach laundry machine is done washing. Or even better, because most people don't actually use matrix right now. If people don't use matrix, well, then he can just add a few bridges to his channels so that if, if people are using WhatsApp, 
if they're using Telegram, if they're using whatever other platform, he can just build a bridge so that the laundry machines can even talk to those people on those other platforms about when their laundry is done, about when their laundry is done. So that's example two. And the third and last example that I want to give is the multinational example. So let's say that, um, let's say that Blake owns a giant company and we're talking like multinational. So uh, Blake has several departments. Those departments are in different countries and they have different boards and their own board members and they all have their own requirements and wishes on how they want to um, have their privacy handled on how they prefer to communicate, how much security they need, how much data sovereignty they need. And they all have their own requirements. But somehow, Blake still wants all those entirely different companies and departments still to be able to communicate with each other. Well, on a platform like Slack or something, you won't, wouldn't really go as far because there are very close um, properties that you can choose. So it's very difficult. But if you choose something like Matrix, oh, if you choose something like Matrix, then you can simply uh, have each company choose their own services with their own benefits and their own choices and options, but they can still communicate through each other as long as they're connected to the same open network. So these are three examples of some, these are some use cases that you can think about. And if you start uh, experimenting with them right now, and especially if you're us still using closed networks like WhatsApp in your company, you really should. You cannot use Slack any, uh, sorry, WhatsApp anymore at this point. So if you start experimenting right now in the next few years, um, and then get an idea of how it works and how you can implement it. And in 10 years from now, your company can fully be implemented in an open standard network where you choose how your data is being governed and how your messages are being sent to whom exactly. So that's what I wanted to tell you. Um, this is also the last part. This was the last part of the webinar. So that's it. If my clicker can go to the next slide. Yes. Um, all right, so we have questions here. Um, there are several, I see. Um, I have a question for you. Yeah. Um, so if I decide not to want to use WhatsApp, but yeah. WhatsApp is in, has a bridge, right. then I'm sending my messages through WhatsApp. Correct. How does it work? So basically, if we're talking about data sovereignty, it doesn't really mean that you're immune to your data getting sent to someone. It only means that you get to control uh, what data you actually want to send. So for example, if I send a message to someone on WhatsApp, then WhatsApp still receives the message and they can do with it whatever they want. But uh, the thing is that you don't, do not send any subconscious messages. For example, as soon as you open the WhatsApp app, then they also already notice uh, you're online, you're reading the conversation with this person, and you don't even know what exactly else they're sending. But if you're on Matrix, then you can consciously choose, I only send the message, I like the color green. And that's all they can receive. All right, so you can control that. Exactly. Nice. All right. There's a couple of questions. I have a question from Rick. Um, the network effect is really key for any chat communication service. Could we build this open sourced, like a distributed DNS for contact chat services? Uh, yes, uh, Matrix actually is open source. So the great thing about this is that even if you don't trust Matrix or you don't trust any of the open source code that they deliver, you can even decide as a company, you know what, I, I will write my servers, my clients entirely myself. Nice. nice. Um, is there a combination to be made with blockchain uh, uh, or smart contracts? Uh, it's a good question, but no. Hmm. So basically, Matrix is decentralized. Blockchain is also decentralized, but it's also that's also the, 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 the biggest thing they have in common. Uh, blockchain is more focused on, well, verifying certain uh, data and making sure that it all works and that there's not a mistake. Whereas with communication, it isn't really focused on making some large uh, computations and all that. It's just focus on talking to people. Right, nice. Um, Gilles, isn't connecting absolutely everything, including giving commands to other machines, really risky? And exactly what people, um, can you scroll up Claudia a little bit? 
Um, all right, risky and really risky and exactly what people like Stephen Hawking have warned uh, for in a letter about the risk of AI um, on multiple scientists a couple of years from now. So this is a question from Gillis. Isn't it a risk that we connect everything? Um, I don't know, actually. I'm not very good at the risk assessment. I do know, however, that the whole idea of the open network is that communication must always be consensual. Right. Like an AI cannot read your messages or talk to you if you do not want to communicate with the AI. Yeah. So I'm not very sure how that goes with the risks, but... Right. As far as I know, if you do not want want to talk to an AI, not much should happen. Right, right, right. Um, all right, Andrew. Uh, Andrew Woodham asks: When you go across the bridge, does this mean that you open your communication up to the security or privacy? That's true, right? So that's yeah, what yeah, yeah. That's what yeah. we discussed. Yeah, but then. Uh, you can actually close it. Is, how how does that then work? So the idea is that, for example, um, uh, let's see. Now, well, for example, let's say Telegram. Telegram uh, per standard, Telegram doesn't encrypt your messages, and they leave it unencrypted on their databases. Um, but the idea is that um, you get to uh, consciously choose. Oh, there's a bridge with Telegram here. So if I send something here, I know that it gets sent to Telegram. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't happen that as soon, as soon as you open the Matrix app, for example, that, matri uh, that Telegram sees, oh, you're online, you're looking at these people, all that. So yes, um, Telegram can still read your messages, but you can make the conscious choice on what you do and do not wish to share with them. Nice. All right, we have a question from Luke. How is authentication handled in the bridges? So would you still need an account on each server you're bridging to? It's a really good question, and it really depends on the type of bridge. So there are different types of bridges. Um, there's like a one-on-one -on -one bridge, there's a puppet bridge, and actually uh, in the live demo that we gave, there are two different bridges. So the um, bridge between uh, Discord and Telegram has a puppet bridge, which basically means that um, there are, every matrix user get a fake Discord user, um, and that fake Discord user is sending your messages as if you sent it on Discord, uh, but they do not show that you're online or something. And the other one is that there's just one user, which is like a bot, and that's on Telegram, and Telegram says basically, oh, this person said this in that chat. Nice. All right. Now, um, we have a question from Charles. Um, how do you start with the matrix? Install it as an app or on a server? How does it work? Uh, that's a really good question. Uh, when I first discovered Matrix, it was very complex for me as well. So basically, uh, Matrix is like a foundation. Um, so they deliver a lot of uh, options and explanation on how you can connect to the Matrix. You can visit on matrix.org, by the way, and then they have a lot of documentation about it. They basically offer you once uh, they have one public server, anyone can join the public server, but they're basically saying, feel free to join it. But the whole point is that you don't need to trust us. So make your own server, um, get some source code, make your own server, your own client and do it your own way so that you know that it can be trusted. So um, companies like WhatsApp and Slack make it easy to install, obviously. Yeah. yeah. Have you seen these kinds of examples of services that use the matrix or um, open to networks? be honest if we compare to com companies like those not yet unfortunately right. so most services are currently starting up because they're one year or one and a half year old uh, ems is currently the the, the biggest one um, and they already do deliver a lot of service where they say oh we'll take care of most of it but it still needs more setup than just telling everyone oh install the app and you're done what do you think, obviously you've read a lot about this and you've worked with this, yeah. what do you think what will happen when WhatsApp or Slack decides, um, hey, this is going to be big, we go for it. Would it be easy for them? Would it be an easy transition? Um, it would be an easy transition for the people on the platform. It wouldn't be an easy transition for the companies themselves because they would need to give up a lot of data sovereignty that they have over the customers uh, and they would just lose it all or a lot of it because um, right now one of their so the problem is that they currently give a lot of new terms and conditions and then a lot of people say well I 
actually don't really agree with right. it, but you know, I still want to talk to my grandmom, so I'm going to use WhatsApp anyway. So as soon as that whole network effect disappears and people can move to over to Matrix, they also will move over. Right. So as soon as they open up, it's very likely that either there's going to be a huge, huge migration or right. WhatsApp is also going to say, well, a lot of terms of conditions that you didn't really agree with, we're going to make those disappear as well. Nice. Yeah. Thanks, Ben. Um we um, we are almost there. Is, are there any other new questions? Um, Bram, there's a question that if if we can uh, give the demo one more time. Yeah, we have five. We have five more minutes it's completely left. Completely fine. Yeah, if you um, can share the screen once more. If you've seen that before, um, I we we heard that it was a little bit hard for people to see the demo. Yeah. Um, so um, if you've seen this before, thanks for being here. It's super sunny outside. Um, so uh, uh, take your time and to be uh, to be in the sun. If you'd like to see the demo again, um, uh, we'll be giving it in the last couple of minutes here. I want to thank all of you uh, uh, for being here. Um, and uh, oh, I see that people are actually in uh, the matrix already. That's awesome. Um, use the link, chat with each other there. Um, we love that you've been here. Next webinar, um, uh, we'll be e emailing you, but we'll be on new technologies that we see in um, sustainability. So I'm um, happy to see you there. And um, Bram, now the floor is yours for the yeah. last part of the demo. Thanks, people. Thank you. Awesome. Well, yeah. So let's see. I see we have some people talking in here as well. Oh, it may be glitching. Uh, let's see. Um, so, okay. Yeah, okay. Awesome, so let's see. On the left we have here Discord again. In the middle we have uh, the Matrix. And on the right we have Telegram. So the actual chat is actually happening in the middle. So we can type here, this is the actual chat. What basically happens is, let's see if I can show you how the conversation works with the room info to people. So basically, there's two bridges in here, which is called the Discord bridge and the Telegram bridge. The Telegram bridge is a program that both has a matrix account right here, and it has a Telegram account. And whenever the, the account in matrix sees a message in matrix, it will then forward it to Telegram. And the other way around, if it sees a message here, like, testing or something in Telegram, then it will forward it to Matrix. That's the Telegram side. But then there's also the uh, Discord bridge. So whenever the Discord bridge notices something in the Discord chat, it will send it to Matrix. And whenever something happens in the Matrix chat, it will forward it to Discord. There's actually a lot of more uh, functionality that there's available. For example, I can even say, well, this is my account on Matrix. And uh, I kind of regret having sent, this is the actual chat. So I can remove that message in matrix. And if I decide, well, I don't like it, I'll remove it. And it will also disappear on the other channels. Or if I ever make, um, let's see, um, let's say I make a typo. I make a typo because there's a zero at the end of it and I don't like that. Well, then I can remove the typo. I can send the message and you will see that it should also get edited on the other platforms. Yeah, there we go. So this way it is possible to communicate with Discord, uh, Matrix and Telegram. Uh, so that's pretty much all there is. Uh, if there are any other questions, feel free to send them in the public chat, but otherwise uh, that's all for the, for the webinar. Nice, thanks for this Bram. This was the webinar. Thanks for um, having me. And um, thanks for doing this. We'll be closing this one off. Um, again, see you next time at the uh, sustainability webinar.